It's really a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, teachers. How many of you are teachers again? Wow, awesome. How many of you work in schools otherwise? Maybe not teachers, but other personnel? OK, how many of you are parents? OK, great. Well, looks like we've covered all the bases. <laughs> um, so you probably know this old adage that we need to take care of ourselves before we try to take care of other people. Because if we don't put on our own oxygen mask, we might pass out. <laughs> So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about stress, why we feel stress, what it is, and how we can apply mindfulness and compassion to helping ourselves so that we can better help the children and, and youth that we work with. So I was a teacher, like she said, but I started practicing mindfulness before I came, became a teacher. And I think my mindfulness was really helping me. But I didn't really know why. And I didn't even know how much until I started supervising student teachers and observing lots and lots and lots of classrooms. That's where my research began, Maria. <laughs> because I started noticing that when we feel stressed out as teachers, sometimes we overreact to situations. And it interferes with classroom management. I was teaching the same students classroom management that I was observing. And I'm thinking, why is this happening? Why, and, and why is the classroom so stressful? So I went back and got my doctorate at UC Davis uh, in California, and I uh, studied stress. And I started understanding better why this is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So stress, as you probably know, originates in this fight or flight response that um, Rick was talking about. Um, it's, it's, I love how you said that it's this, uh, what, did you, what word did you use, prehistoric or something? Uh, no. Uh, Stone Age, thank you. This is our Stone Age lizard function. I, I love that. I think that's great. Um, that really, for, for tens of thousands of years, has kept us safe. So, and, it, and, it, and today, we associate the parts of the stress response with emotions. So our fight response is often associated with anger. So when we feel angry, it's usually because we feel threatened and we feel attacked and we feel like we have to defend ourselves. That's, that's kind of where that comes from. When we feel afraid, it's because we also feel threatened. We also feel like we're being attacked. But instead of fighting, we choose to run. So that's what the stress response does for us. It protects us. As, as Rick also mentioned, it it's begins in this core of our brain. It's like we have this little alarm system in our brain that's constantly scanning for danger and occasionally goes boing, and we react. And when our bodies react like that, when that part of our brain fires, it floods our body with neurotransmitters and hormones that give us this extra energy so that we can survive, so that we can run really, really, really fast, or we can fight really, really hard. It gets our heart rate up. It gets our blood pressure up. It gets our cortisol up, as Kim was talking about. Um, but the problem is, we're not being chased by a lion, you know? So the Stone Age threats that our bodies evolved to deal with are, are not what's stressing us out. When I'm trying to give a lesson in my classroom, and, and I'm looking at the clock, and I see I have five minutes left, and I've got this student over here that keeps interrupting me, I start feeling really annoyed. You know, and in, in, in teacher language, we use words like annoy and frustrated. We never say we're angry. Oh, never are we angry. But just like that lion, our bodies are responding like that student is attacking us. Because we have a mandate to get through this lesson in this number of minutes, and he's interrupting us, or she's interrupting us. And so our body goes through this response. But it's a psychological threat. It's not a real threat. It's all in our heads, OK? And this, um, this stress reaction can actually interfere with our relationships with other people, <laughs> right? Because let's say this student really has an important question. And what I've been saying doesn't make sense to her. OK, and she's interrupting me because she really wants to know more about this. But I have a history with this student. 
about something else, let's say, and I'm really feeling stressed, and so I, I imagine, I, I, I praise her behavior in a negative way, and I assume that she's doing this intentionally to drive me crazy. And so I snap at her. What's happened to my relationship with her? From her perspective, she just really wanted to learn, right? And this teacher is being mean. Okay, from my perspective, she's just annoying and she's trying to make my day miserable, right? So I've damaged a relationship with a, a really important relationship with one of my students who wants to learn. <laughs> so part of being able to bring resilience and mindfulness into our teaching involves being aware of our emotional states and noticing when we start to feel a little bit annoyed. So one of the ways we can do that is knowing about how different emotions affect the way we're feeling. So for example, when we're feeling happy or joyful, we can be activated in a, in a positive way. Um, we can also be activated in a negative way if we're really angry, like the picture below. Um, if we're sad or depressed, it tends to deactivate us, kind of make us slump into ourselves. So noticing these bodily sensations that are associated with these feelings Bringing mindful awareness to our bodies can help us regulate our emotions better. So briefly, what are the functions of these emotions? You know, the, the way we experience emotion is a, is a much more subtle and kind of refined interpretation that our brain has of this core part of our brain that tells us whether we're threatened or not, or we're, whether we feel safe and loved <laughs> and taken care of and, and having all the things we need or whether we're being threatened or not. So the negative emotions, which I like to call uncomfortable or unpleasant emotions because they're not bad emotions, they're, they've really helped us survive, um, they trigger this stress response. They narrow our visual focus, not only our visual focus, but our mental focus. We focus on one thing. We focus on the lion. <laughs> we miss the rest of the picture. Um, we, it also reinforces our negative feelings with thoughts because, and that's an adaptive function, because if I really am threatened, then my mind can help keep me, keep my cortisol up and keep my adrenaline going so that I can keep running, right? So that lion is really scary. He's really, really, really scary. He's gonna eat me, he's gonna eat me. So, so rumination or that thinking like that when we're feeling these emotions is an adaptive function, believe it or not, to help keep us feeling the way we're feeling. Um, but when we're aware of that and we use mindfulness, we can see, oh, that's just my lion's chasing me thought. <laughs> you know, it's not me. It's just what my body does and my brain does when I feel threatened by a lion. <laughs> um, it also can create these, these conditioned reactions or responses to, to situations that you carry with you for the rest of your life. And I'll give you an example that you project onto other people, too. I'll give you an example of this one. Um, when I was a little kid, I was still, this was back, this will tell you how old I am, uh, it was back in the day when kids could still go outside and play without supervision. I know, it's really sad. But um, when I used to go out and play, I would lose track of time because I didn't know how to tell time. I was just a little kid. And I would come home late sometimes. And my parents would get really mad at me, really mad. Sometimes if I was really late, I would even get spanked. So in my mind and in my body, being late is really bad. Anybody else have that script in their head? Yeah, OK. So I'm driving to a doctor's appointment. I look at my watch. Oh, I'm late. Guess what happens to my body? Oh, I'm st I feel afraid. I feel like, oh, no, I'm going to be in trouble. Somebody's going to be mad at me. So I start noticing that my accelerator <laughs> starts to push. Up. Then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's just my I'm late script. <sighs> OK, I can stop. I can See, I notice this tension growing in my body. I notice my tendency to speed. I notice the thoughts in my head because I apply a mindfulness to it. And I can stop it. I can give myself some space. So um, then what, what about these positive or pleasant emotions? What do they do? So there's a scientist named Barbara Fredrickson who's done a lot of work on this. And one of the first things she did was that she assumed that they must do something maybe to undo 
the negative effects on our body of the negative emotions. So she divided up people in thirds. So let's see, we've got a third here. I'm going to do what Kim did. A third here, a third here, and a third here. And all of you are going to watch a movie that's really scary. OK? And so you're all going to start feeling afraid because you've watched a scary movie. Then I'm going to put you all in different rooms. And this group over here is going to keep watching more scary movies. I'm going to put these people in another room, and they're going to watch a travel log of Banff, Canada, OK? And, and this group over here is going to watch a really hilarious movie of a bunch of playful puppies. And I'm going to monitor your autonomic nervous system and your cortisol in each of these conditions. So what she found was it's pretty obvious. These guys are still really feeling afraid. What do you think about this group? Eh. What about them? <laughs> They're feeling a lot better, right? Well, she did find that these positive emotions do turn off the stress response in a way. But they also do lots of other things, like build resources with one another. When we're feeling happy and together, we feel more connected to one another. Um, and this is really important in educational contexts. Um, it also broadens our focus, exactly the opposite of the negative emotions. We can we can see everything that's going on. We see the context of the situation. So instead of imagining that the student is trying to make my day miserable, I can go, oh, she's really curious about this. She has some passion here. Wow. Maybe, I can t maybe we can take this on later, and I don't have to feel this time pressure. And I can say, wow, I really appreciate these questions you have. And I'm also aware of the time. Maybe we can talk about this after lunch, you know, instead of snapping at her, right? Um, openness, again, <laughs> to others' perspectives, that fits there really well. And creative responses to situations. When I was teaching classroom management and I had students that were really stuck with what to do about a certain behavior, I would say to them, well, what have you tried? You know, and I've been teaching them all kinds of strategies. And they would say, well, I've done this and that. And I'd say, this and that. Really? That's everything? That's all you think there is to do in this situation? What, we, we narrow our, you know, our possibilities for how to respond. We just think about this and that. We don't think about the hundreds of thousands of other things we could do, including nothing. You know, We could do nothing. We don't always think about that. So another thing, this builds on what Rick was saying. Um, we can get ourselves stuck in these negative thinking cycles. Just like he was saying, you know, we have this, this, this bias, this negativity bias. And the reason why we have this is because if I am walking down a path and I see something that looks kind of like a snake, if I jump back, even if it isn't, I'm more likely to survive than if I go, huh, I wonder if this is a snake. Ah. You ever hear of the Darwin Awards? <laughs> That's a Darwin Award. <laughs> Takes you out of the gene pool. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> we can also create these positive spirals of emotion by doing what Rick was talking about. And one way I like to describe what he was saying is I like to savor them, like savor those emotions. Just like you might taste some really great wine or chocolate or another whatever you love to savor. So when you're feeling joyful or grateful or just happy or inspired, what does that feel like in your body? Or loved? What does that feel like? F really feel it. And mindfulness can help us do that. Because like, like Rick was talking about, when we practice regularly, we build the parts of our brain that help us feel what we're feeling and bring mindful awareness to what we're feeling. I don't need to tell you this, because Rick already told you this, so I'm going to skip it. But. One of the reasons I think it's so important today is that the level of stress, of psychological stress, not real threats, not real physical threats, but psychological threats have not only grown for us in our experience today, we feel them a lot more, um, <laughs> but we don't know how to modify or adapt to this modern world. If you took somebody from, the, the, um, from ancient times, I'm talking like during uh, you know, the 
when people were evolving these bodies that we have today, and you put him in a car or an airplane, how do you think he would feel? You know, or put him in a room full of people that look really, really different than him. You know, that would freak him out, totally. So our bodies are kind of freaking out a lot. <laughs> so I see mindfulness as a really critical hack, like a biohack, that we need to learn in order to adapt to this modern world that we've created that's driving us crazy. Um, because we don't have to overreact to everything, <laughs> even though sometimes it feels that way. And mindfulness can really help us. So when you think about resilience, it's important to remember that there's lots of different domains of, of uh, resilience that you might want to cultivate. You can, you, we all know about our bodies and how to build resi resilience in our bodies. But what about mental flexibility and our attention, our ability to focus? What about emotional flexibility? What about emotional mastery? What about really tuning in and knowing what's going on in our emotional experience? And then spiritual flexibility our understanding of our inner world and how we connect with something greater than ourselves. How do we build that resilience too? And having a balance in these domains and however you want to do that uh, is important. Because if you favor too much one or the other, you end up losing resilience in that area or that part of your life. And all of them are critical to your well-being. But if you're like me, one of the reasons I'm an expert in self-care it's because my whole life I've been really bad at it. I mean, really, honestly, it's a struggle. You know, it, it is something that I've had to work really, really hard at. So I want you to just take a couple of minutes and think about what your barriers to self-care are before I start telling you some of mine, because I'm, they're probably very similar. Um, so take a moment to think, and then I'm going to give you a minute or so to talk to the people around you about about your barriers, OK? So go ahead. No shortage of barriers there, huh? Well, I think I can trust you to know that you have barriers and what they are. Um, what the, the biggest barrier that I've discovered over the years is, there's two actually. One is recognizing what I need. Like really recognizing what I need. Being aware of it. And it, this one goes hand in hand. It's, believing or really being committed to the understanding that I deserve care. Anybody else feel those two? Is that it? Um, so for me, mindfulness has been critical in helping me notice not only when I feel like I don't deserve it, but also to help me remember that I do need it and what I need. So those two go together. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I discovered by practicing this when I was still teaching was, I don't know if you ever feel this way, oh, nobody appreciates me. I do all this for all these people all day long, and nobody appreciates me. Oh, they won the award. I didn't, because nobody notices me. Oh. Guess who's not appreciating who? So what I realized when I would get into my martyr complex, that's what I started calling that, that's Tisha's martyr complex. I would go, oh, wow, I'm not taking very good care of myself. Wow, I really put myself out during times that I really couldn't afford to. I've been doing all this stuff because somehow or another I, I feel like I'm supposed to, but without taking care of me, I'm running out of steam. <laughs> and oh, I guess I better step back a little bit. I guess I better take care of myself. So for me, when I start hearing that voice in my head, the martyr Tisha's martyr complex, I can go, oh, I guess I'm not taking care of myself. 
you know? <laughs> so, so that, for me, has been a big eye-opener, how mindfulness can help me with that practice. So also, mindfulness and compassion can help us. And one of the ways that it can is by helping us give ourselves a little bit of space. And I love this quote from, from Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our freedom and our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. So both mindfulness and compassion give us space in different ways. Mindfulness gives us the ability to observe ourselves, observe our minds, observe our bodies, notice that we are not our minds in the core of who we are, our thoughts, our bodies, that there's a core in there, an observer that is beyond those thoughts, those random ruminative thoughts, those martyr complexes. They're not us, right? So we have that space. And compassion gives us another kind of space. It gives us, it fills that space with love, which is really what we need. Create the space and then fill it with love. So just briefly, what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is being present with this moment with an attitude of openness and kindness and curiosity. What is going on in this moment? Because we spend most of our lives thinking about the past or thinking, planning the future. We spend a lot of time in those places. But we rarely are here in this moment. And uh, I love this picture because I spend a lot of my time with garbage in my head like that picture. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time with my dogs. I have three dogs. And it's very obvious to me that they don't have that kind of garbage in their head, which is really nice. <laughs> and I love this quote from the Dalai Lama. And Kim already defined compassion for you really well. This seeing suffering, recognizing suffering, and this motivation to help. And I love this quote from the Dalai Lama. I had to bring in a quote from the Dalai Lama. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. Because as you practice compassion, you will feel happier. Just like, you know, we all went into teaching, we all went into education, we all became parents because we care about kids and we want to do good, right? And it's enjoyable to show compassion and love to our children. But when we extend ourselves too far, you know, when we don't remember to put on that oxygen mask, then we can slip into those spaces like my martyr complex. And we, th then we can't be so helpful. Then we, can, then we snap at our students when we, we shouldn't. So how do we practice mindfulness and compassion? You may have seen this before. This comes from the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society, which you can Google. And it's kind of hard to see. I know this is small, but there's a lot of different contemplative practices in a lot of different traditions, including the indigenous uh, communities of our land here that have taught us different ways of contemplating the moment in a kind and caring way. So uh, finding what works best for you is part of the process, part of the journey. And I wanted to uh, leave you with a self-compassion practice. And so I'd like to uh, invite you to... Um, just noticing the time, and I want to make sure I'm time fitting everything into my time. So this is a short practice, and it involves starting to sense or feel loved or cared for. And so I invite you to, if you want to, you can close your eyes or you can lower your gaze. If it feels comfortable, you can put your hands gently on your chest. And take a moment to recall a time in your life when you felt very, very loved. It might have been a time just yesterday when you saw an old friend and she gave you a big hug. It could have been years ago when you sat on your grandmother's lap. Whatever. Think of a time when you felt loved loved unconditionally, loved deeply. It could have been when your dog ran up and licked you. There's probably lots of times like this, but 
for this practice, just think of one time. And when you've found that time you want to focus on, see if you can step back into the past and be in that time and place now and tune in to how your body feels. How does it feel when someone loves you deeply? Now that you've touched that feeling, savor it. You could imagine that your body is sucking it in like a sponge. But as you're sucking it in, you're tasting every little bit of it as it enters your bloodstream. It enters your marrow, all the parts of your body. And now just recognize the fact that you did that all by yourself, just using your memory of one time. This was just a little nibble of what you could do on a regular basis. So now you can open your eyes and just notice. You can just sort of look around the room and see how everybody looks. A room full of really loved people is wonderful. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Um, I want to briefly talk about my care research um, because I know there's going to be care trainings here in British Columbia. CARE stands for Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education. And it's a mindfulness-based and emotion skills program for teachers that we've been studying in several different randomized controlled trials in the United States with uh, large numbers of teachers. And what we found, which is very, very exciting, is that not only does this program improve teachers' well-being and their mindfulness and their emotion regulation, but it also improves the emotional supportive relationships that they're building in their classroom. And that data comes from observations, objective observations of classrooms. The teachers show more sensitivity to their students, and their classrooms are more emotionally positive. And finally, their students are more productive and engaged as a result of this. Um, and this research was funded by our government, which is really awesome. Um, and we are seeing a lot of interest in this program because the level of teacher stress today is just getting higher and higher um, all over the place. I'm sure you know that. It is here too. Um, so how, what are some tips for self-care going forward? Set your intention. The reason why I skipped over the intention is you've already done the intention, so I thought this would be okay to skip. But when you think about intention, think about your GPS for the day. Where are you setting that GPS? And think about setting intention as like keeping yourself on course towards that intention to remind yourself. And mindfulness can help you because you can check in. Am I on track? Am I not on track? If you're not on track, you don't have to beat yourself up. You can just get back on track, you know? Mindfully observe yourself, and that can be associated with your uh, intention setting. Recognize the habits of your mind and see that they're just habits of mind. Balance your domains of care, self-care. Generate self-compassion, and that practice we just did is a way to generate self-compassion. Connect with others, as we've already heard, that's really important. Accept from others. This is another barrier I have, is being willing to accept from others. And then practice compassion. So um, I will be here uh, later for a book signing if you want to get one of my books, Mindfulness for Teachers, where we go into this in a lot more depth. And if you have any questions or comments or anything, there's my contact information. And it's been such a lovely pleasure to be with you all for this short time. And I look forward to seeing you for the rest of the day, too. Thank you. <laughs>